the Sultan. It's always a great pleasure, as my viewers know, who are thousands of you, to visit with us, stay tuned in with our programs every other week. For those of you who have been consistently and constantly following the themes, topics, and interests of Afghan ascent, um, we cannot help but remember together the spectacular performance that um, the audience was treated to via the musics that came from Berkeley College of Music embodied in the presence of two extraordinary African-American students, a male and female, Desmond and uh, Tassara, who, uh, as you recall, uh, gave us a performance of a lifetime. The themes that they handled with so much musical talent were the painful themes of Black Lives Matter. Tonight, by way of continuing this musical infrastructure that was laid for us by two young minds, I decided and I consider myself uh, to be quite lucky to invite one of uh, Berkeley's greatest musicians. If you were to go to Berkeley and if you were to mention uh, the name Prince Charles Alexander, uh, you would immediately be told that he is brilliant, honest, humble, and courageous. Uh, African Ascent had been quite lucky in the past uh, to, to have invited him and to have benefited uh, from his insights and uh, wisdoms, both within Berkeley and outside of Berkeley. And um, introducing uh, my guest is not uh, something that I could do extemporaneously. Uh, I prefer not to do so. Uh, instead, I'm going to begin the program uh, by reading uh, from the bio directly. Uh, and then uh, I'll also treat you to a read on uh, Black uh, Lives Matter uh, from uh, a writing um, that I just gleaned as I was uh, preparing and uh, researching our exciting theme tonight. So, here is the bio. Uh, be patient. I'll, I'll read it slowly. Prince Charles Alexander has an MS from Northeastern University and a BA from Brandeis University. He's also a graduate of the prestigious Boston Latin School, the first public high school in America, founded in 1635. Prince Charles and the City Beat Band uh, recorded three albums on Virgin Records from the early to mid-80s and achieved their biggest successes on the European charts. Charles fronted the group as the lead singer and multi-instrumentalist, the futuristic wind synthesizer called the Lyricon, was the instrument that made his brand of next-generation P-Funk unique, and the group sound incorporated many of the devices that would propel rap music to the forefront of the American music scene. With the emergence of rap as the dominant reflection of street culture, Prince Charles disbanded his funk group and began focusing on audio engineering. After the switch, Prince Charles Alexander became a multi-platinum recording engineer mixing engineer and producer for a large client base, including Mary J. Blija, uh, the notorious B.I.G., Puff Daddy, uh, Usher, Boys to Men, Geodesi X Clan, Brandy, Babyface, Sting, Aretha Franklin, and many, many more. 
Champafi Combs utilized the technical expertise of Prince Charles, uh, for which, incidentally, he's quite well known at Berkeley, uh, Ton Maserati and Paul Logos as his first string mixing engineers, a move that helped to launch and sustain the Bad Boy record label for many years. Charles's accolades include more than 40 platinum and gold certifications from the RIAA, three Grammy wins, and seven Grammy nominations from NARAS and Victoria de la Musique, the French equivalent of a Grammy. Prince Charles is currently an active producer engineer as well as a professor in the Music Production and Engineering Department at Berklee College of Music in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, as you know, uh, Berkeley is considered, um, quite rightly I think, uh, partly as a function of the fact that I'm very proud to be there at the, the leading college for the study of contemporary music. He also holds an adjunct instructor position at NYU's um, Clive Davis Department of Recorded Music, teaching music production. Professor Alexander also taught audio technology at the Institute of Audio Research in NYC and has lectured at the City College of New York in Manhattan. He's a member of the Producers and Engineers Wing of the Grammy Committee Board of Governors, the Audio Engineering Society, AES, and the Musicians Union, Local 802 in NYC. His daughter, Katrina Jackson, is a graduate of Emmanuel College and teaches math at the Boston Public School System. His son, Romeo Alexander, a, is a graduate of Harvard College and PhD candidate in applied math and oceanographic studies at NYU's um, uh, Curant Institute. Professor Alexander currently lives with his wife Candice and their two, uh, twin children, Chloe and Aidan, in Boston, Massachusetts, and New York. Welcome to Afghanistan. Thank you, Dr. Kiros. That was a great introduction. I well want to meet deserved. that guy. <laughs> <laughs> well deserved. And now, before we start uh, our business, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which is going to be quite heavy, uh, on a very uh, heavy, and uh, timely matter. Um, I thought that um, I should begin uh, by uh, reading uh, from this uh, excerpt that um, I saved uh, from a piece called uh, Black Future, uh, Futures Month, uh, written by Chanel Matthews, very grabbing. Black Lives Matter reinterprets February observes second annual Black Futures Month. Today, Black Lives Matter launches the second annual Black Futures Month, a deliberate reinterpretation of the resistance and resilience of black people as illustrated through art. In an impressive compilation of visual art and writing, Black Futures Month uses creative expressions to visualize and discuss issues that impact black communities like labor, reproductive, and gender justice. Black Futures Month is a shared vision of the movement of, for black lives. We aspire to use art to imagine what the future of black lives looks like, said Tanya Lucia Bernard, Arts and Culture Director for Black Lives Matter. Quote, we are committed to remembering, celebrating, and learning from our history but also imagining our future, but also imagining our future. Black people are more than what happened to us. 
Each day in February, Black Lives Matter will release an original piece of art and an accompanying written piece to reclaim Black History Month and demonstrate the importance of using art, the importance of using art as both an inspiration and an organizing tool. Artists from across the country have been commissioned to use their genius to promulgate the conversation about systemic racism and violence against black people globally. Black people globally who have experienced systemic violence at the hands of the state have been robbed of our capacity to dream about our futures. Sir Darnell Moore, senior correspondent at MIC News. She continues, because of the violence imposed upon us, we're often forced to think about how, how to move from one day to the next. Black Future Month gives us the space we deserve to dream beyond that. Black Lives Matter is committed to sending state-sanctioned violence against black people. Violence like environmental racism, as illustrated by the man-made Flint water pandemic and the systemic murder of black people by law enforcement. Art, I'm tempted to add slash music, is an integral part of this ongoing struggle, complementing on the ground organizing practice and tactics. Black Futures Month is the visual representation of our violent lived experience, said Opal Tomet, co-founder of Black Lives Matter. He continues, it is directly connected to the fight, directly connected to the fight to end the state-sanctioned violence against black people and is a visual manifestation of what black liberation looks like. Powerful words. Powerful, <coughs> That's powerful great. images. That was really great. So I thought we should begin there. Let's first uh, talk about Black Lives Matter globally. I've traveled the world. I've been to Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Denmark, Holland, Sweden, uh, Senegal, mm. Japan, Malaysia. What I've seen around the world is, uh, was reflected in some of my readings in college. Uh, Chinua Achebe, Things Fall Apart. Uh, how Europe colonized Africa. And I would go to different places. And in some of the Nordic countries, I wouldn't see black people. I would be the only black person. I was there as a musician. I would get asked if I was in the armed services because we have many African Americans serving in uh, those countries that are in the armed services. And I understood what that was. You know, it was, it was a way for whomever I was speaking to to make sense of my blackness in their world, in their environment, because it was not a norm. Their norm looks like them. And then in Africa, I saw a different norm. I saw a norm that looked like me. And it affected my consciousness. Of when I first went to Africa, I remember idolizing an actress, a Caucasian actress. She was blonde and thin nose. And I was like, she's really beautiful. 
I went to Africa. And my sense of, of beauty, even though my mother is, is African American and I was dating African American women, I still had a certain aesthetic and an idea of what beauty was. Because everywhere I look in America, I see this aesthetic. I went to Africa and I saw a different aesthetic. And I realized it was me that had work to do in order to bring myself present to this idea that black truly is beautiful. And once I arrived at that place, and this is you know, my, my 20s, once I arrived at that place, I realized how much work I, as an African American, had to do in order to arrive at that place. My God, how complicated it must be to be Caucasian in America and to arrive at a place where you can look at an African American and not just see the artistic beauty or the cultural beauty or the swagger, but to see a human being that lives and thinks and breathes and, and has a moral code and, and, and other things that are normal. Black Lives Matter across the globe, and I remember being young and uh, seeing on television or people talking about going on vacation. What is this vacation thing? Mm. I finally grew up and went on vacation. I went to some exotic island. I get off the plane. Who do I see? My people. In service to the dominant culture. So I'm getting off the plane with the dominant culture. And I'm looking at my people, and, and I'm thinking to myself, so this is what the dominant culture is talking about when they say vacation. Go somewhere exotic and interact with a people that's not like them and feel some kind of way about themselves. You know how it made me feel? It made me feel sad. Because I could see that the black lives did not matter. It made me feel a sense of tragedy that this is the representation of hundreds and hundreds of years of oppression, not just in America, but across the globe. That Africa itself, this beautiful continent, has been raped and pillaged and murdered for centuries. And that the consciousness, just as my consciousness was affected by looking at the images in magazines, the, even the African consciousness has been affected so that when the colonization or the colonizers pull out, the African mentality left behind is still utilizing the tools of the colonizers. Incredible. We have so much work to do. Of course. I don't want to be silent. <laughs> and it always amazes me when you're posting things on Facebook about racism or Twitter about racism, <sighs> that you hear the I phrase. But I'm not racist, Prince Charles. And I didn't have an apparatus to counter that until I read Dr. Joy uh, DeGruy's book, PTSD, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome or Post Traumatic Slave Disease. She gave me an, an apparatus to work with. Because in that book, she says, we are, have all been affected by slavery black and white. And we, none of us have been able to decompress from this, to, to go somewhere to have therapy about this, specifically black people. But even, even our Caucasian brothers and sisters have not gone anywhere to, to be able to, do, to decompress this. So our, my Caucasian brothers and sisters conveniently gravitate toward the I concept. But I'm a good person. And my African-American brothers and sisters gravitate toward the we concept. Trayvon is we. Eric Garner is we. And it's very difficult for my Caucasian brothers and sisters to get this point. And I'm like, how, how can that be difficult? When you look at me, you say, oh, Prince Charles, he's successful, he's wonderful, he's good, he's got all these things going on, he's an awesome human being. Yes, but I have a child that could be going to the store to get Skittles 
and could be molested, harassed, abused until our society cares about the, the least of us correctly. We are all in this pathos. Black Lives Matter calls attention to humanity. It says Black Lives Matter. And it's not Black Lives exclusive of white lives. It, it's, you know, you have to laugh. You have to laugh at the attempts of people that have not a worldview to look at the concept of Black Lives Matter and say that it's an exclusionary concept. I, as a white person, am excluded. No, you as a white person are not excluded. You as a person that feels like you have no empathy for black people are going to create exclusion in your life. But if you feel for us, if you feel for, I can't take this off. I cannot relax about it for a minute. Oh, relax, Prince Charles. It's not all about black and white. Oh, why isn't it? That's my reality. When I look in the mirror, I see the same face that hoses were being pointed at in the 60s. I was that child. And I've never forgotten that. I have children that did, for them, that's ancient history. And I try to remind them. And we're all being touched by this. I have fear about going to certain places in this country. Of course. I fear about going to certain places in this city. Of course. <laughs> right I, around Berkeley. <laughs> Oh, and why do I have fear? Why should I have to have fear? You know, my white colleagues, may, oh, I'm afraid to go into a black neighborhood. The injustices that I've seen perpetrated in this country have been much more heinous perpetrated against young African-American bodies. I've never seen a white town firebombed by black people. I've never seen a, a white body dragged until the skin peeled off by black people. These are relatively common events in the America that I grew up in. And I can forget, but forgive? Or maybe I can forgive, but forget? Forget it, Prince Charles. It's all in the past. Well. There are lots of groups that speak for themselves. And we need leaders to speak for ourselves. Our best leader was assassinated. That was doc Dr. Martin Luther King. He was bringing us together. He was, he was consolidating the energy. The Black Panthers were being derided in America, unjustly so. I was a kid. I saw the Black Panthers. I saw somebody that was trying to reach out a hand to a young black person and saying, hey, you have value. You have worth. And we have the right to bear arms. So we will bear arms to defend your value. And then all of a sudden, California is saying, well, you, you, can't buy, you can't be walking around with guns. I, it's a fascinating world. And it's not, this concept is not unique to America. This concept is a global concept. A global. Uh, we hear about the musician and the, the wonderful experience that the musician has in France. Oh, France, that's where Josephine Baker was and things are cool and the cool jazz musician. Hey, I've been to France. My ex-wife is French. My son is half French. I've lived there as a human being, not just as a musician. When you go as a musician, it's lovely. Hey, we like you. When you live there as a human being, now you are creating a dynamic. Are you an immigrant? Are you French? Are you an African? What country? And then it just starts getting very, very bizarre. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of, uh, of Le Pen. I think it's Marie Le Pen. Marie Le Pen is the daughter of the other Le Pen, which, who started the, the, uh, the FN, the French Francais National Movement, which is basically the, the right, right wing movement. And uh, she's, uh, she's doing well on the political scene in France these days. 
probably because the dominant culture's numbers are starting to shift. The minority culture numbers are on the rise or across the planet. And the dominant culture has been kind of being, being cool, you know, laying back, let's have one child, you know. And over time, this whole thing is sifting out and becoming something different. And the dominant cult culture wants to maintain its control and maintain its power. I guess if I was in power, I'd want to maintain it too, <laughs> you know. But there is a cry, a cry for some equi equanimity justice, empathy, compassion, love. It's always amazing to me when I see uh, a Caucasian person weigh in on Facebook and, and say something about the I state, once again. It's always the I state, and Dr. Joy DeGroot speaks about that, that the dominant culture always says, but I'm good, and I can find your good so we don't have a problem because I'm good and you're good so we don't have a problem. How does that solve the problem if your Caucasian brother wants to kill me and kill my son? And who's supposed, I didn't invent racism. Black people didn't invent racism. The dominant culture invented this, this idea that the darker the skin, the more oppressed you would be. The lighter the skin, the less oppressed you would be. So it would make sense that when we speak of racism, it's not a black issue. It's a all of us issue. Black people cannot solve the pathos of racism. It's going to take all of us, primarily, from my point of view, the Caucasian race. The Caucasian race has got to look at itself. And if, if, if one of my friends says to me, but I treat everybody with respect, I would ask my friend, take that same sentence, replace I with we, and use the we as a representation of all Caucasians. And now say that phrase to me. We, Caucasians, treat everyone with respect. Does that even sound right? Even to you, my Caucasian brother, does that sound like a statement of realism? When that becomes a statement of realism, then we will have made great strides in this country. Black lives will matter. Asian lives will matter. Native American lives will matter. Caucasian lives will matter. Hispanic lives will matter. I don't know if that's the, the reality or the truth at the moment. And of course, great people and great minds of, of all races think like this. But we have a responsibility to uplift our brothers who are not yet in this space and to help their progeny to not continue on this path of tragedy. Remarkable. And now, <clears throat> what I'm uh, truly impressed by while listening to you is that you are a celebrity of a great standing a well-deserved title that you worked very, very, very hard on. And yet, you are conscious of your human space. The celebrity has not clouded your judgment, nor does it unnecessarily lead you this individual path of paying a blind eye to the conditions of people who look like you and me. There is a painful paradox between the celebrity statuses that our African brothers and sisters attain through hard work and the fact that some of them are forced to pretend 
the people who look like them are not being abused, particularly when they are systematically housed, sheltered, dined and wined at places who give them this illusion that they are exceptions True. to the black condition, which leads them, as you put it brilliantly, to think and encourage some Caucasians to isolate their achievements and say to them right to their face, look at you, look at how much you have achieved. Other blacks are not like you. You're different. You're different. <laughs> this is what gives me pain when I work out at the gym when I'm in buses and trains, and I see people who look like you and me being treated in a bestial way, and yet I am singled out because I dress well, because I speak with an accent, because I have this aura, and in that I am treated as different. And I say to myself on philosophical grounds, I am not different, and I don't want to be looked at as different. Right. I rather prefer to be looked at as part and parcel of these systemic, barbaric structures in which I live, which I did not choose. It is painful, isn't it? For me, it's clear. It's clear for me because of my children. When I was young, perhaps I was trying to elevate and achieve something, I call it leaving the planet. You're so wealthy, you're so famous, you elevate and you start to look, everybody, everybody's green. Nobody's black, nobody's white, everybody's green. And then I started to have a child and then another child. And then you start to understand that Emmett Till was a child, that Trayvon Martin was a child. child, and that my child is actually walking out away from me today, and I want that child to be safe. And maybe my child will go to a neighborhood and feel unsafe, or maybe my child will go to a classroom and get suspended for something that another child does the same as my child, but that child doesn't get suspended. And then that system starts to continue and unravel. So yeah, I'm at the school to make sure that the school is aware. And I've got stories. Me too. Me too. All of <laughs> my mother was at my school to make sure that my school was aware. And I see it in the children. So when, whenever anyone talks to me and says, well, Prince Charles, you're a great human being, you're a great person, it's all good for you and I love you, da 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 da. Yeah, but if you love me, that's not solving anything. You have to love my child. And not just because my child is brilliant, because I know that I will have a brilliant child. You have to love my child even if my child is not brilliant. You have to love my child if my child is brilliant walking down the street in a hoodie. You have to love my child if my child is not brilliant and walking down the street dressed in a suit with a tie. I don't know how we not that I don't know how. <laughs> I, I've studied enough to know how we got to this place. How we solve it That's is multi-generational. It's multidisciplinary. It's uh, multi-ethnic, the solution for this. And we seem to have one ethnicity, one people that's concerned with this more than other people's. And you're like, guys, girls, planet, don't you see that we're all in this little boat called Earth together? We're all rowing this thing. And maybe we can't get along. But in America, we're going to have to figure something out. While I live and breathe, and I'm on this planet, and I'm in this country, 
there is no better country on the planet for free and de democratic ideas, yeah. I think. Yeah. And I know you're from a great country. But, so America, but America is a great it's place. It's your country also. Yeah. And this is my country. I don't want to go anywhere else. I, there is nowhere else for me to go. I don't know where I come from. You know where you come from. I don't, I'm an African American. That has its own unique trajectory from anyone else, from Hispanic people, from Asian people. And I, I love all my peoples of color, but African Americans have a very unique Correct. history Correct. and identity. Correct. A hidden identity. Indeed. And so this is my country. This is, this is it. Of course. I'm not trying to go anywhere. So we've got to make this one work. We've got to make this one right. And I think that Black Lives Matter is, is the beginning of no, I shouldn't say it's the beginning. That's wrong. It's the extension of a very long fight, a very long and continuous journey that we're still on, that the Supreme Court is involved in, that Congress is involved in, that the Senate's involved in, that we have this beautiful black president is involved in, that each one of us on a, that have the ability to vote are all involved in. So for every person that doesn't go out and vote, you know, that comes back and reflects on us because of the people that take office and the, the laws that they try to implement and the laws that they try to rescind. Just because affirmative action existed doesn't mean it's going to last forever, as we've seen recently in Supreme Court cases, where they've actually tried to roll back some of the Voting Rights Act. And I'm like, is anybody paying attention? You know, 1865 was the end of the Civil War. And 1878 was the beginning of Jim Crow because they pulled the troops out of the South. It's like we actually needed troops in the South in order to keep things at bay. So you pull the troops out of the South, and it was like, hey, gee, I just love black people now. <laughs> it wasn't that easy. Mm -hmm. And w literally, what is this, 150 years later, we're, we're still fighting the Civil War. That's right. Justice Scalia just died. That is the civil war that you're getting ready to see Barack Obama throw himself into the middle of. What is this country? What does this country stand for? Is this country open and pluralistic? Or is this country founded on a, a document by men that did not even look at women as human beings, let alone a black person? I love this constitutional rhetoric that goes around these days. I love this country. I love the, the democratic constitution. But the constitution got a lot wrong, and that is why we had amendments. And there's still a lot that can be worked on. And for anyone to say, well, I'm an originalist, Rubio and Cruz and I don't know, they all start blending in after a while. I'm an originalist. The original constitution said this and that. First of all, you're interpreting. Second of all, that's a document from 1776 and women and blacks were not included in that document. And if you think they were, then you've been under a rock. There have to be modifications. There have to be alterations. There has to be a way to, if you, we want a society that's equal, there has to be a way to look at it. And I think that Black Lives Matter is the extension of the people, one of the strongest peoples in this country. I mean, come on, we have had the whole weight of this country. We've, we've created the economic structure. We've, we've created the, the, serv the service class. African Americans in America have built this country. And we have borne the, the weight of, of this country, of, of the, the sheer desire of this country to want to be great on the planet. We had to lay down so that our brothers could stand on our backs to become a great country. So we're strong. Just because we're strong does not mean you can abuse my black body. Oh, let's whip it one more time, because they can take it. They can take 50 lashes. I can't take one lash. And if you give me one, I probably should give you one. Oh, but I can't give you a lash, because you're going to shoot me. Hands up, don't shoot. 
Oh, you're being racist. You, black person, are being racist because you said hands up, don't shoot. You, Beyonce, are being racist because you formed an X at a football game. You, Kendrick Lamar, did you see Kendrick Lamar's yes. performance at the Grammys? Yes. Loved it, thank you, thank you, Kendrick. Finally, you know, an artist is speaking, saying something, doing something. It was theatrical, it was artistic, but you know, it needs to be said. Well, I saw lots of that when I was in the 60s. And where did it go? I don't know. You know, like you said, we've had these ascending black people, successful black people. You're different. Oh, you've got a Maserati. You've got a Lamborghini. You've got a, a Bugatti. You know, you've ascended. Exactly. And I know some of my black friends. I think I, I, some of my very successful black friends are Republicans. Mm. And that's like, <laughs> somebody said, that's like a roach supporting raid. <laughs> raid is the stuff that kills roaches. But they are, they are conservative fiscally. It's about let's conserve money. Yeah. And I get that. Yes. But when the people that are Republicans then go beyond let's conserve money, let's conserve policies that hold people down, then I have a problem. Yes. You know, let's conserve concepts that will make people feel less than. I have a problem with that. And we are on, all on this journey together. I don't have solutions other than the best solution is for everybody to be empathetic and care and be concerned about the least of us. It's, it's written in the Bible. It's I'm sure, I've read the Koran enough. I know there's some issues with the Koran, but there's some great stuff in the Koran. There's some great stuff in the Constitution. There's some great stuff in uh, the Communist Manifesto. Karl Marx said some great things. He said some crazy things, he said some great things. So this idea that we as human beings, the human condition is trying to strive for a goodness gets countered a lot by the idea that the human condition is full of a lot of badness. And we have the yin and the yang of humanity. And that's why I think Asian philosophy and Eastern philosophy is on to something with this concept of yin and yang. So when you can look at these polar opposites and understand that it's the flow of life, you've got to have a lot of maturity. And we're asking a lot of a lot of people to be that mature, to understand that flow. And then you manage that flow. And that's what our democracy was. You've got the liberals, you've got the right wing. There's nothing wrong with being right wing, there's nothing wrong with being liberal. And at some point we meet in the middle. And we're not trying to meet in the middle right now and that's fracturing not only our national politics but our state politics and our local politics. Okay. And now, uh, now uh, Charles. Uh, let's um, uh, descend um, carefully, uh, as you have been, from the global scene to the national American scene, and we have already touched on some, of it, yeah. touched on some parts of it. And now I want us to descend even further to the um, Berkeley uh, yard in which I and you as educators and many others like us are trying to cultivate a new generation of musicians whom we dream because we are artists would be different from their parents, right. different from their grandparents. But then, uh, sadly, Charles, my two bright students came to tears um, as they were sharing with me in intimate terms about their sufferings at Berkeley, both as blacks and more specifically as black musicians whom they contend uh, 
takes place in the classrooms as they are interacting with their professors and also some of their classmates. That for me um, as an educator was a painful space and it was painful for me to listen to it because as an educator uh, and so are you uh, we're accustomed because we have to pay blind eyes to the residue uh, of these uh, endemic racist relics and practices of the past when we encounter them in the presence of some, if not all, students with whom we cannot be honest right. because there is a price to be paid. Right. Because the college cannot have but pay blind eyes to some of these relics of the past because it's a tuition generating college. Exactly. And we cannot afford to alienate and bite the hands of those who feed us. I do understand this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a mature way. But some of our students are no longer willing to put up with this. They are becoming angry. <laughs> I wonder what your, your take is um, on this. I know I and you think the world of Berkeley. I know I love Berkeley. And I also know you love it. Mm. And, and, and my dream is to cultivate a new yard, as Diderot would say, as an educator, in the only yard in which I have. But in order for me to cultivate this new yard, I must feel absolutely free. Uh, I should not feel that I cannot discuss racism in the classroom. If I must discuss it 95% of the time, I have no choice but to discuss it because, as you eloquently put it, the problem is occurring 95% of the time in black people's lives. Correct. I don't even have to see it to know that it exists because a, a lot of the systemic racisms that live in our culture uh, are already woven into the fabric of our society. Um, what I try to ask my African American students to do is to excel because we need to be three times better in order to be at the table. It's almost a luxury for an African American person to be just as good as. You've got to be three times better. So my students who are just as good as the white students that, that face another kind of issue in the classroom, that's, for me, where the, the problems are. That, for me, is where lots of counseling, lots of communication, lots of understanding of who we are as a culture, looking at documents that portray us correctly and not incorrectly in our education systems. Many of the kids that come to our school were not in school systems that gave them information about who we are as African Americans, uh, the strength that we have, the resilience that we have, the power that we have, the influence that we have, the support that we've given this country. And if you haven't gotten that information, it's imperative that African American professors, African professors convey that information, do extra support. And I just recently read an article about the African-American professor in higher education and probably in high school education. You have to do more. Yeah. I can't just come to school and 
teach and then leave. I have to support. I have to go to the concerts. I have to go to the recitals. I have to, to listen and my one hour uh, office hour turns into a three hour office hour. It's exhausting. But we have so much work to do. So much. That if I lay down, I don't know who's going to pick up the mantle behind me. No one. And I have to make sure that this baton keeps moving. There, like I said, there's a lot of work to do. I, I love doing it. I love educating people about racism. I love it. <laughs> Very often we have clinics at Berkeley because I, I think Berkeley's probably a rare place. Very Roger so. Brown, Larry Simpson, the, 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 the uh, president and the provost, they get it. They understand that these conversations need to be had, but they are an institution that has to generate money. So there's a certain bottom line that they're addressing. And then when they can, they get to other things. And periodically we have events at Berkeley where we open the, the discussion up. And who comes to those events? Dr. Kiros, you know, it's the same people. The, the choir comes. Yes. And every once in a while I say, you know, I would love to have some racists in this room right now. <laughs> I just want to go toe to toe with a racist. Please bring it on. Let's do it, you know? And I'm not seeing them. And I'm so not afraid of that because I, in, I, I'm, I feel insulated. But, could I think like that at Alabama or Georgia Tech, or would I be afraid? And this is what I, with the freedom that I have at Berkeley College of Music to be able to speak the way I speak, I still think about my colleagues all across this country. Can they speak like that? And if they can't, why can't they? We have so much work to do, so much work to do. So, for our kids at Berkeley, it's a better place than a lot of other places. And I went to Boston Latin High School, and Boston Latin High School is, a, is in the news right now in right. Boston because of some racial slurs that were thrown out on Twitter concerning the Ferguson incident. That's right. And the black students put it all together, knew who did the tweet, went to the headmaster, and the headmaster did nothing. And they didn't know what to do with that information. They didn't even know how to process that. How could you possibly not do something? They didn't know how to process it for, I think, 10 months or 14 months or whatever it was. And here we are now dealing with that concept. This has been your host, Theodros Kiros for African Accent. I suggest to my viewers, if you have time to pursue this conversation as it takes place in Rob, Reading Review, which is a radio program uh, to which I am a regular columnist.